on, the films did become bored yet, and the sexual innuendo riskier as the carry-ons tried to attract bigger audiences during a period when going to the movies was losing out to the rising popularity of television. But the carry-ons were never actually about having sex, they were about not having sex. And the men, and sometimes the women, always left frustrated. How do you feel about the double entendre side of things? It's innocent fun. They're just a free entertainment. There's nothing truly defective about it in any shape or form. And the carry-ons did actually challenge sexism. Carry-on girls centred around a feminist protest against a beauty contest. And carry-on cabbie tackled the battle for sexist head-on, with the women being victorious. With Hattie Jakes not feeling very happy with her husband, she got all these brilliant women to go into the sheet of gown for him. Two of the main actors, Kenneth Williams and Charles Hawtrey, both gay men, were playing outrageous, flamboyant and camp characters. Criticised for promoting stereotypes, others say they were groundbreaking during a time when being gay was still illegal in the UK. The social background was of sexual repression. So, you, you know, out of that came a lot of camp and sexual innuendo and play, because that was a release at the time. Despite the huge success of the films, they were made on tiny budgets, with location filming being almost unheard of. Valerie Leon's debut, Carry On Up the Kyber, in 1968, being a notable exception. They did some of the filming in Wales, which had to stand for the Kyber Pass, which was amazing because, in fact, it was so realistic. We had Indian gentlemen writing to Peter Rogers and saying, I knew that pass, and, and uh, you, you captured it beautifully on film and everything. Of course, not realising it after all actually being filmed in Snowdonia in Wales. Although Kyber and some of the other carry-on films featured white actors playing non-white roles, which wouldn't be appropriate today, one line directly attacked racism in Britain at the time, in which black and Asian people were being banned from being bus drivers. As with almost all of the films, the real joke was often about British pomposity and the so-called sniff upper lip and mocking the very idea of empire. There were 31 carry-on films in all, that's more than any other British film franchise, including James Bond. Sixty years on, and despite depicting attitudes and humour from a different age, their popularity continues, with surviving stars still receiving fan mail from all around the world. It's quite extraordinary that carry on films have been shown even as far afield as India, China and Japan and people are thrilled to still see them on television. They're on all the time and even today we want to laugh, perhaps today more than ever. And it brought pleasure to many of us. Indeed it did. So thank you Charles, and thank you Kenneth and thank you all the others because uh, wherever it came from, Writer John Antrobus and actor Valerie Leon were speaking to me, Ashley Byrne, for this edition of Witness. It was a made in Manchester production for the BBC World Service. This is the BBC World Service, where the story of Ruben Hurricane Carter continues. The famous American boxer and 19 year old John Artis were convicted of a triple murder in the 1960s. Fifty years later, John Artis remembers the night of their arrest. He says, just say that Reuben Carter killed these people. We'll let them go. If I can't do that, that would be a lot. The Hurricane Tapes, Sunday at 20.30 GMT. And in an hour's time, the latest global events in World Update. And on our website, you can explore more programs from documentaries to science. Just go to bbcworldservice.com Stay with us, the Arts Hour is next. This is the BBC World Service, the world's radio station. Coming up on the Arts Hour with me, Nikki Brady, director M. Night Shyamalan tells us how he looking at them and you're seeing a story being told in images and then one image stops you is telling you more or it's more complicated that's the beginning of film school Ronaldo Marcus Green talks to me about his Sundance award winning film Monsters and Men and reveals who his mentor is Argentinian ballerina Marianella Nunes tells us how she copes with pre-show nerves Karen Kusama whose movie Destroyer stars Nicole Kidman tells us how she directed the actress that was the most important aspect I think of our relationship was just giving her that latitude to be as unruly and 
reckless as the character really is. We hear from Stan and Ollie, actor Steve Coogan and John C. Riley. All that and more coming up on the Art Tower. I'm Stuart McIntosh with the BBC News. Hello. The president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, has returned home after breaking off a foreign tour to address days of violent protests in his country. He said chaos and insubordination would not be tolerated. The president also criticised the police and the army who have been accused of brutal suppression and said that, if necessary, heads would roll. The opposition says security forces have killed at least 12 people and, speaking to the BBC, one of Zimbabwe's leading human rights lawyers, Beatrice Mtewa, said people were still being attacked and intimidated. People are being dragged out of their houses, being beaten up, being assaulted, being denied access to legal representation, access to medical attention, and where they are arrested, being denied even food, water, and other forms of sustenance. A former U.S. Marine arrested in Russia on suspicion of spying is appearing in court in Moscow today. Paul Whelan was detained in Russia last month, allegedly, as he received state secrets. Mr Whelan insists he's innocent. There's been speculation that he may have been arrested in order to swap him for Russian citizens in the United States. Moscow denies this. Sarah Rainsford is at the court. His lawyer has told me that Paul Whelan thinks that the FSB, the Russian security forces, have made a mistake. And the lawyer said he and Paul Whelan himself are currently trying to explain that position and prove that position to the investigators. Now they're questioning uh, Mr. Whelan in the fort of a prison, which is where he's being held. Once a week, he, he's meeting them for several hours to go through the evidence that they're presenting. The lawyer is saying that so far, he doesn't believe that there's a case to answer. The leaders of Germany and France will sign a new treaty today, pledging closer cooperation in a post-Brexit European Union. Critics say the deal is short on substance, but Jenny Hill, who's in the German border city of Aachen for the ceremony, says it's a show of unity at a time when the EU is facing huge challenges. 56 years to the day since their predecessors signed the Elysee Treaty, the treaty that in effect ended centuries of enmity and hostility between France and Germany. Today's treaty is about deepening cooperation, strengthening the relationship between those two countries right at the heart of the EU. And I'm John Merkel and Emmanuel Macron are coming here to Aachen because this was the capital of a vast European empire back in the Middle Ages, ruled over by the legendary Charlemagne. Those, those, those of the leaders are, are hoping to really harness that history when they sign the treaty. A court in Tokyo has rejected a new bail request from the former head of the Japanese car company Nissan, Carlos Ghosn. He's facing trial for alleged financial misconduct. He's been in custody since his arrest two months ago. World News from the BBC. Afghan officials say at least 65 security personnel are now known to have died in Monday's devastating attack on an intelligence base in Wardak province, about 50 kilometres south of the capital Kabul. The Taliban said it carried out the attack. The roof of the main building collapsed after the militants rammed a vehicle packed with explosives into it. Activists in Pakistan say a leader of an ethnic Pashtun movement campaigning against enforced disappearances has been arrested on terrorism charges. They said Alam Zeb Mesud, a founding member of the Pashtun protection movement, was taken into custody in Karachi. Here's Ambarasan Etirajan. The arrest of Alam Zeb Mesud and other members of the Pashtun protection movement came two days after the group held a rally in the southern city of Karachi. Police on Sunday said they were filing complaints against Mr. Mesut and other activists for making inflammatory speeches against the state at the demonstration. Amnesty International has urged the Pakistani authorities either to bring Mr. Mesut to court or release him immediately. The movement has shaken Pakistan's powerful military with its campaign to end alleged abuses by security forces targeting ethnic Pashtuns in the northwestern region. Indonesia is reconsidering its decision to grant an early release from prison to a Muslim cleric linked to the 2002 Bali bombing after an intervention by Australia. A security minister said President Joko Widodo had asked him to review all aspects of the planned release of Abu Bakr Ba'asir. The nightclub bombing killed more than 200 people, many of them Australians.
A Taiwanese social media celebrity known as the Bikini Hiker has died after falling into a ravine during a solo mountain trek. Igi Wu was an experienced hiker known for posting photos of herself in a bikini after she climbed some of the highest peaks in Taiwan. BBC News. Hello, this is the Arts Hour on the BBC World Service. I'm Nikki Beatty, and what we have in store for you is 60 minutes of the best global arts and culture conversation from across the BBC and beyond. In just a moment, director M. Night Shyamalan tells us about his new movie, Glass. Reynaldo Marcus Green talks to me about his award-winning debut feature, Monsters and Men. It tells three different stories with a connection to the killing of an unarmed black man by a white policeman. Argentinian-born ballerina Marianela Nunes talks pre-show nerves. I get more nervous now than I did when I was younger. I think it's because probably you know a little more, but thank God, I think I work better under pressure and I I'm hungry for it. Karen Kusama talks Destroyer, her latest film starring Nicole Kidman, and shares her movie-making thoughts. Actor and director Clark Peters reveals his love for classical music, and we'll hear from Rosalia. <laughs> One of the BBC Sound of 2019 artists, the first time ever, by the way, that an artist in the winning lineup is singing in a language that's not English. I love that. And that's not all, folks. Actors Steve Coogan and John C. Riley tell us about becoming and understanding Stan and Ollie, better known as Laurel and Hardy. And we'll be hearing why one of my studio guests, pianist Kirill Gerstein, has chosen to take on one of the most difficult piano concertos in the world. He's joined by critic Karen Kuzanovic. So let me ask you both, first of all, we'll be hearing the filmmaker Ronaldo Marcus Green talk about his mentor. Have either of you got or have you had a mentor? And if so, who is it? And what's the most important thing they've taught you? Kirill, let me come to you first. Well, as a musician, as a pianist, perhaps the mentor I particularly single out is Ferenc Svados in Budapest great Hungarian guru of many musicians and if I had to single out one thing I think perhaps it's coming to a situation without a preset expectation and preset responses to it and it's a lesson that translates into life. Karen what about you? Well there was a film producer who was Oscar nominated that took me under his wing and showed me a lot about life in general books and how to think but also about story and also about how to shut up once in a while. That was useful. Now you just shut up when I want to say who is this film <laughs> producer. Is that a secret? I shouldn't mention his name either. Oh, I love this. Look, there's glamour already on the show. Film first then, and the roller coaster career of American director M. Night Shyamalan has just swirled and dipped and dropped off the final movie in what no one really knew was a trilogy. First, there was Unbreakable. A sort of low-key superhero film starring Bruce Willis as David Dunn and Samuel L. Jackson as Elijah, a.k.a. Mr. Glass, the villain obsessed with comic books. Then came Split, a cult smash, which revealed the multi-personality serial killer Kevin Wendell Crumb, played by James McAvoy. And we find out that he exists in the same universe as Unbreakable's David Dunn. Are you still with me? In Glass, David Dunn, who's been keeping the streets of Philadelphia safe, and Kevin Wendell Crumb, who's been doing exactly the opposite, are arrested and sent to a psychiatric hospital for evaluation. They meet an old patient, a wheelchair-bound man, Mr. Glass. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the East Rail 177 trilogy. So, Glass is set in the wing of a hospital that treats people who believe they are comic book characters, a new disorder that all the aforementioned characters have. When Samira Ahmed spoke to M. Night Shyamalan, she asked him what were his comic book influences. Well, there's a lot of answers to that, but probably the easiest one is Spider-Man. I grew up when they were doing all of those kind of reruns of Batman things. And, yeah, and the Hulk was coming out a little bit later, the TV show Hulk. I mean, the actual comic books was more Spider-Man, and then in the Indian culture, they would do kind of comic books of the Indian religion. The Amatita culture? Yes, 
Look at you. Yeah, everyone I know in the indie diaspora grew up reading them. And of course, they're essentially superheroes. In exactly, movies. exactly. So I collected all of them. I mean, I had hundreds and hundreds of them. So what were your favorites? Gosh, I mean, you know, now it's all my parents unboxed. They better have kept them, by the way. And, you know, what happens as a child if you're looking at a frame and, and seeing something, like let's say there's a page with six cells on it, and you're looking at them and you're seeing a story being told, an image of an eye looking up, you know, a hand reaching out, and then one image stops you because you're moving from image to image, and then one image stops you, it's telling you more or it's more complicated. That's the beginning of film school. What you're looking to do with the composition is really underline what the character is feeling. So you first have to get a very specific feeling out of the, the character. So the actor, the, the screenplay has to be evoking something very, very precise. And then you use the, the camera. What were you seeing in the, the characters and then the way that you used in the film? Can you give me an example? Yes, every frame of the movie. You know, I, I storyboard every frame of the movie. So it takes me about three months before we shoot. It's really time-consuming and difficult, like drawing an entire movie before you shoot it, but it allows me to make the movies very small and be super efficient, because that's all I shoot, is exactly what I draw. Um, so for example, there's a really climactic therapy scene in this bubblegum pink room, and with all the characters in this kind of group therapy scene, with a psychiatrist, and, and it's 11 minutes long, and every single shot is emphasizing whose moment it is and what they're feeling. There's also color. Mm. The psychiatrist is these beautiful, gentle pinks and grays, very soft. Mm. Which and then that pink bubblegum room. Each of the main characters has a kind of signature color. Yeah. I'm interested in how you play with them because, mm. of course, the soft colors make you think instinctively she's a Christmas monkey. Mm. 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 And you're obviously subverting all these expectations with all of these elements. Well, really, what it is is there's a theory that we go under when I make a movie, and especially with these three movies. The primary colors represent the comic book world. And in Glass, they have their colors. As they start to believe who they are, you know, David Dunn's green starts coming out. The ochre color for the beast starts coming out. And Mr. Glass has purple. And I chose them for specific reasons. Green is life-giving. And so David Dunn would be the protector, you know, of life. The ochre color comes from a religious ceremony. It's kind of like the monk color. And I saw him as an evangelist, kind of protecting those that are broken. And purple I chose for Mr. Glass because purple is used often for royalty, for this kind of legal things, even as far as the Egyptian things that they use purple for that reason, and he perceived. to predict the weather or changes in the stock market and so on, you can take really complex, rich, from healthcare, from wearable technologies, from genetics, learn what features are really important for that individual and to be able to help guide doctors to give patients. Parking mode off. So 是否願意選擇綠色燈裝
另一本《激情時刻》，又點可以令佢失望呢？亦咁咧，日本殿堂級男士飲品，希臘食品一支裝一茶即飲，助你擁有大師級完美表演。今日就同你一齊體驗極致快感啦！好冇？飲極飲 X 萬寧熱賣，查詢二八三二九一六八。优化蒸降机资助计划，资助合资格楼宇为旧 l i f 加装安全装置或者换新 l i f 每个 l i f 最多作五十万噶，咁我都叫发团搵保养承办商睇下大厦啲旧 l i f 要唔要加安全装置先。想知多啲，打三一八八一一八八问下啦。如果你就嚟出外旅游，通讯事务管理局提醒你，唔使用数据漫游嘅话。喺離開香港時，可以要求營辦商暫時停咗佢，或者自己刪咗手機嘅流動數據同數據漫遊功能。如果要用手機上網，可以申請定額收費嘅數據漫遊服務，或者買張喺目的地用到嘅預繳智能卡，租用 WiFi 版都得。最好收埋啲軟件自動更新功能啊！李光文冬季大減價，港九代理同時響應。六点二十一分，红色火灾危险警告生效，气温十八度，相对湿度百分之四十一。毛衫、线衫、八五折酬宾，着尼高文秋蝉羊毛内衣，成身暖晒。指美国通知渥太华当局将正式提出引渡华为副董事长孟晚舟。北京批评加拿大任意滥用同美国嘅引渡条约，敦促加方立即释放孟晚舟，美方撤销逮捕令。陈先文报道。加拿大驻美大使麦克纳顿接受加拿大环球邮报访问，指美国已经向加拿大政府表示，将正式提出引导华为副董事长孟晚舟，但系未有说明几时提出。按照引导协议，华府必须喺今个月三十号前提出引导申请。华为回应报道话，将密切关注事件进展，重申华为遵守业务所在国嘅所有适用法律法规，希望美加政府早日还孟晚舟自由。喺北京，外交部发言人华春莹批评加拿大任意滥用加美双边引导条约，严重侵犯中国公民嘅安全同合法权益，促加方立即释放孟晚舟，美方立即撤销逮捕令。加美呢，任意的滥用他们之间的双边引渡条约，对中国公民的安全和合法权益构成了严重的侵犯。我们敦促加方呢立即释放孟晚舟女士。切实保障他的正当合法的权利，我们也强烈敦促美方立即纠正错误，撤销对孟晚舟女士的逮捕令，不向加方提出正式的引渡要求。美国以华为违规同伊朗交易为由，要求加拿大拘捕孟晚舟。孟晚舟上个月喺温哥华转机时被捕，其后获准保释，但系一直被限制。